a real face of the Russian world. Shattered families and crippled fates. Brotherly love that brings nightmares and tragedies. The Kremlin has spent decades and billions of dollars to establish a myth of kinship between the two peoples, a myth that was crushed with the first strikes of Russian missiles on peaceful Ukrainian homes. The stories of four Ukrainian families that had to put their lives back together, piece by piece, in our special report, Ukrainian War, two years of Russian terror. All this was shot through. There was a crater here from a gas pipe explosion. There are only four wheels left from a neighbor's house because it all burned down. Katerina's family is unlikely to forget the nightmare that the so-called Russian world brings. They have already managed to escape this horror twice. The first time this happened was 10 years ago, when they had to leave their home city, Donetsk. It was summer already. When we were leaving Donetsk, the first roadblocks on the highways were being built just in front of our eyes. And people were walking around there. In general, there were already a lot of Russians with weapons in Donetsk in that time. There was some machine gun burst in the courtyards. We realized that there was no Ukrainian army in Donetsk. And the last straw was a column of tanks driving through the center of the city with a right into Lviv. And after that, I realized if they are here, then Donetsk will no longer be safe ever. And that was it. Then we just took backpacks, a guitar, packed a chill stuff and got on the train in Yasinovata. And our parents supported us. They agreed to sell the property that could be sold in Donetsk so that we can look for something and buy it here. So the family ended up in Hostomel. They renovated their new house. Katerina set up a workspace. She is a jeweler. I first met a pendant with the outline of the Donetsk region. Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimean people, we were all the first displaced people. So for us to have a piece of our native land was simply necessary. Pendants with what regions are most often purchased? With the Donetsk region. It seemed to be a new chapter of their life. I have decided to conduct a special military operation. They will shell in on the other side of Hostomel, and the paratroopers will land in there as well. We have already learned this lesson after Donetsk. As long as the Russians are not around, let anything happen as long as they're not here. Being so close to the front of all these years has made us to get used to it and has developed some kind of a habit. We're used to the fact that they shouldn't bomb. At the beginning of the full-scale war, Vadim happened to be in Mariupol, which was near the front line at that time. With my wife, we were basically determined that something was going to happen. The children didn't believe us. They even made fun of us a little. But just in case, we went to the market and bought a battery-powered receiver, battery-powered lights and batteries. My wife and I both had a feeling that something was going to happen, but we just didn't expect it to be that huge. Russians were entering from four directions at once, through the state border, from Belarus, from the occupied Donetsk and Luhansk regions, and from Crimea. On February 24th, Alexandra had no idea that she would have found herself in occupation for long eight months. 
Yeah. I woke up in the morning on February 24th. The first thing I did was I looked at my phone. I saw that Kiev was being bombed. I could hear explosions in Kherson. But we all thought at that time that it would be for a day or two. The explosions were very loud. I live in house number 18, and they hit building number 24. The same street. There was a school there. They repeatedly targeted there at the school. There was a lot of damage. At that time, we still had the internet, and everyone was passing on some information, filming from their balconies, how the occupants were coming in, how they were spreading across Kherson. On February the 25th, they drove in a convoy towards Kyiv. They were shot at, but they came back, stood at the crossroads and have been firing at civilian cars for six hours in a row. At the crossroads, the Russians shot up 10 civilian cars. This is how the world saw the real face of the Russian army. The roads of the Kiev region were strewed with the bodies of those who tried to escape from the deadly brotherly hugs. Meanwhile, the street fights had already started in Hostomel. It's totally surrealistic. We had guys shooting right next to our house, and we were literally about 50 meters away from them at the window. At night, the battle started, and we went into the basement and stayed there until morning. Because the tanks were firing specifically at this block, they hit here and the neighbor's house, so a crater appeared. I had half of my workspace blown away, a wall fell down here and a corner there, everything. Windows slid, half of the house was smashed, and after that we realized that we couldn't stay here any longer. Mariupol quickly became encircled. The defenders of Ukraine heroically held back the onslaughts of the Russians. In response, the enemy was wiping the city of the face of the earth. There were explosions not far from our house, maybe two, three hundred meters away. There was a hospital 500 meters away from us. They were bombing it. There were jets flying over us, bombing everything. When this heat started, we were already in the basement. Those shellings ramped up every day. When the jet started flying, we were in the basement and heard that the jet was flying and we already knew that it was going to set off a bomb. So it flew by and something exploded somewhere, but a bomb is not a bullet, you know, it's bigger. And you being in the basement can feel how the ground is shaking. One day in the morning, we heard the announcement of the evacuation meeting. They named around three or four places, maybe, of gathering around the districts for people to be evacuated. One of those places was the drama theater. Somehow we managed to come through that road mass and when we arrived there was already a line of cars near the theater. We were at the rear of that queue and then somebody came out of the drama theater and announced that nothing was going to happen and we had to go home. We decided that if we had already left our house, then we should ask to stay in the theater to wait for the evacuation. It was not a place to hide, just to wait for the evacuation. Until my last day there, people hoped that there would be an evacuation, that there would be hope, that there would be the Red Cross. Everyone had such big hopes for the Red Cross as if it were God. Katerina and her family decided to get out on their own. They went to Bucha, which back then was quiet. I opened the wicket and it was just the apocalypse. Something was shooting, burning, slamming, 
and we realized that we just wouldn't make it because we would have to run through the intersection and they were constantly shooting at it. So we instantly decided to move along the fences to Bucha. Because our in-laws live there. When we contacted them before that and asked what was going on in Bucha, they said that everything was fine there. They had light and it was quiet. That since the Russian column was broken up, everything was cool there. And while we were walking through the forest, we saw how houses were burning. Many town houses were already on fire, including those that were just being built. So we saw this with our own eyes, all these consequences of the airstrikes. Well, now, when we got to the our in-laws house we realized that it was not like we thought it would be at all half a day and the situation did a u-turn they were sitting in the basement there was almost no cell phone service we saw from the window how snipers were shooting at the upper technical floors, how shells were flying into the apartments, incinerating everything. And we realized that they were already here. They were already near. The Russians disrupted any attempts to evacuate the civilian population in Mariupol turning the once blooming city into a ruin. The local drama theater became a shelter for hundreds of people. This is where we gather people for the food distribution. First of all, we give food to children, women and old people, and then to men. All of this was under constant bombardment. Another challenge was the lack of cellular network. It became almost the only means of communication. There was another family in the drama theater with us, and the girl had a similar one. So our two radio receivers were a source of information for all people stayed in drama theater. There was a small hall and people from all over the theater came there. The morning news started at 9. Everyone gathered there since they already knew we had the receiver on. It was like in the World War II movies. People came from everywhere to listen to the news. The whole hall was filled. People were listening and making sure that no one would make a single noise. Of course, the connection was being muted. It was luck when you could just catch, hear the voice of the motherland, and then it was disrupted with the enemy news. When the connection was completely bad, since they were muting it, of course, we listened to their news, understanding that everything was a lie there. On March 1st, they entered Kherson and Massa. Before that, they had been in Saklanit. And on March 1st, they already came in and started hanging out their flag. March 13th is an incredible day for every citizen of Kherson because on March 13th, 1944, Kherson was liberated from the Nazis. But this time on March 13th, the Russians started shooting. Then came the nightmare which the residents of Kherson had so bravely resisted. The occupation troops unleashed terror in the city. They arrested patriots, tortured and shot them. They grabbed people just on the streets. I saw how they were harassing a guy. I walked through the archway and somehow ended up in a big courtyard of a multi-story building. And I saw these animals undressing the guy. They were getting into the shuttle buses and saying, you go and you out. And the men were taken out. They were undressing them. It was summer. They were looking at some tattoos, tattoos related to our indestructible Ukraine. There is no electricity. 
we still have gas and that's it, and, and no water anymore. And neighbors start saying that someone heard or saw cars being shot. In the morning, a car with a woman and a child arrived near a house. They tried to evacuate, but the Russians saw them, fired at them, turned them around and did not allow them to leave. They hit the child. I think they hit a woman too. Then there was a doctor in a basement, and she gave them first aid. They were bandaging them. And that's how we all learned that we couldn't evacuate in cars. When men were coming, they were detained. So you couldn't go by car, you couldn't go through the central street, so you had to walk by foot and through the fields. We left early in the morning. We were working on food. There were a lot of children with us. We walked 11 kilometers. We passed by, and there were the Ukrainian armed forces or the territorial defense forces servicemen there. I don't know exactly. They were standing there and gave each of us a hand, and I took each of them by the hand and didn't want to let them go because I was so happy that I could see our people. There were these abandoned suitcases everywhere and all the jazz and they said that we have to go through the planks to the other side we went out and there was a man standing there giving instructions to everyone he said now you go out along the fence then duck down and run to the buses don't stop otherwise you will die the Russians were shelling the evacuation corridor. I mean, there was also a video of them sending drones there, and how our guys were standing there and shooting off those drones. And when we ran out, we had an explosion. So they were trying to hit somewhere. We were formed into small groups to run and get on the bus. Terrifying footage of people hiding from the Russian shelling under a destroyed bridge has spread around the world. The Russian Federation tried to cover up its crimes, blamed Ukraine for the terror and called the victims actors. The picture of you during the evacuation became very famous. The Russians apparently really liked your sneakers. They said that it's staged. All around us, everything is staged because my sneakers are so clean. And if I was in evacuation, they couldn't be that clean. And these photos that everyone saw later, both Katya's with the child and mine with Granny, were taken on this very section. When we were coming up from the bridge, it was about a kilometer to those buses that were there. They didn't come closer either. And we had to run too. Run or you will die. And there was a serviceman standing there. He said to put hats over our children's eyes because they must not see this. It was a woman running with two children just 15 minutes before us. And they were hit. And that's it. She was lying right there. Vadim decided to escape from the blockaded Mariupol on March 14th. It was morning, maybe 10 o'clock. I went out in some kind of an organized convoy of cars. One small convoy left in the morning and it was the second one that was being organized. It was apparently the main one. I was driving through the bomb out city. The border part was broken and shut up at the equipment was broken. Mines were scattered almost everywhere. And that's how we went out. I was driving in a convoy, then I saw a rural water truck. I said, can we pass through Nikolska? This is the road that leads to Zaporizhia. First you go through Nikolska and then you go to Zaporizhia, not to Berdyansk. He said, yesterday people were still driving there. I left the convoy, turned around and went to Nikolska. 
И пошел из Манушина на Никольское. Перед Никольским. In front of Nikolsky, I saw two cars, and there were young people, guys, girls, who did not know where to go. They were deciding. I said we must go because if Russian come, I will be the end. And the locals said that the Russians are already in Nikolsky. I said, guys, we must go. So we kept driving until at some, I don't remember which one anymore, the fifth, sixth, seventh roadblock. I went first, they followed me, I went through, but they didn't. So they disappeared or they were stopped, they were captured, and one of the guys had his tattoo cut off alive. When Vadim and his wife got to leave, they learned that the Russians had dropped a bomb on the Mariupol drama theater. It is still unknown how many people died under the rubble, but we are talking about hundreds. The Russians could not have been unaware that they were civilians. The sign in front of the building said so. At the end of my time there, this idea was discussed. I even said that, guys, it could get worse because of this sign. Of course, the idea was right. That's how it turned out. Not because they wrote it, but who they wrote it to. That's the problem. The Russians are building Potemkin villages on the ruins. Putin's propaganda reports on the reconstruction of Mariupol, but in their reality, there is devastation, leaky roofs, and the deaths of thousands of people from the Russian bombardments behind the bright facades. But the cynical lies of the Kremlin heralds are not surprising. For example, in Kherson, they tried hard to create the illusion of prosperity. There was an advertisement that a Russian academic theater was opened in Kherson. We had a head of the production department. Then he was caught for bribery or embezzlement, brought to the guard, and he became the head of theater. And the traders went to work for him because of the money. I met with artist Sergei Garmash from Kherson. He then asked me to gather the staff, and we would have a creative meeting with Russian and Kherson artists. I said, you and I had a past, but we have no future. But neither propagandists, nor Russian actors, nor referendums and banners promising Russia forever worked. People waited for liberation from the occupiers, and they finally got it. Eight months of occupation, eight months of terror, torture, harassment and hunt for patriots. On November 11, 2022, the Ukrainian army liberated Kherson, the only regional center occupied by Russia. It seemed that the suffering had come to an end. But the Russians began shelling the city almost every day. And on June 6, 2023, they blew up the dam of the Kahovka hydroelectric power plant. Kahovska hydroelectric plant was blown up. It was the 6th of July, and then there were calls to friends. A lot of destroyed houses. Down there were the river station and the Ostrov neighborhood. It was all polluted up to the second floor. It was all gone. And the Ostrov neighborhood, Zabalkin, Tchaikovsky Street were flooded. My friend suffered a lot. Alashki, the left bank, Zbruiv, Kahola Priest, and Radins were underwater. And the left bank, some barges broke off there in the Hebrew Park and it blew everything away. It was coming. The water current was very strong. It destroyed everything. Another act of terror and ecocide. Thousands of people have been trapped in water and sentenced to death by the Russians. There is no door. My son used to live in this room. He says a serious piece was taken out of the wall. This is where he usually sleeps. 
At that time, he went to the bathroom because he was getting ready to leave for work, and everything that flew ended up on the bed. And everything that flew ended up on the bed. If he had stayed in the room, I don't know what would have happened. I don't even want to think about it. Kharkiv resident Tetyana recalls how she miraculously survived after the Russians shelled the city. I was here. I didn't have time to look out of the window. I was putting something away, making the bed. I don't remember what I was doing. But I remember the sound, and then I was thrown backwards somewhere over there. Were you hurt? I was hurt. That's why I'm working wearing this. As you can see, my neck was hurt a little bit too. No, trochę. A missile hit the sports court in the yard. Shrapnel tore through the apartment. That's what's left from January 2nd. It is when my little brother let my mom out of the room to wash her face and stop the blood. Uh. It was January 2nd, 2024. According to my count, there were three airstrikes. After the second one, my mother wrote, we are fine, only the windows opened. But after the third one, about five minutes later, my younger brother called me. He was also in the apartment and said, Sanya, come here quickly. When I arrived, I saw a lot of destruction. The blast wave had smashed windows in the houses, even on the other side. Your father was killed in the airstrike, right? During the third airstrike, he was outside. He was planning to meet a colleague from his work. He went out at the entrance. There was an airstrike, and his right hand was severed by this wave and shrapnel. He was alive, but there were many wounds. So he was the first to get help because he was outside, and he was found first. But unfortunately, he died a week later. Two years later, the nightmare that Vadim endured in Mariupol has not left him. Even hundreds of kilometers away from the Russian border, Vadim doesn't feel safe. However, it's the same for all Ukrainians. You know, attacks, missiles that fly into Lviv and city can be hit. For me, the very existence of Russia is a danger. They hate us. In two years, the war began to move on to the territory of Russia. Since January 2023, Ukrainian UAVs have attacked the Federation almost 200 times, targeting military hangars, enterprises, ships, airfields and airplanes. So Russians have experienced what casualties and deprivation are, not from the screen of the propaganda TV channel. They felt it. They felt the fear that we experienced when we were shelled. All wars end one day or another, with the defeat of the criminal system, the collapse of the brutal regime, the fall of the curtain of insane propaganda, and the hard realization of those who were fooled by this propaganda. This truth about what Russia has brought to Ukraine under the guise of brotherly love will be revealed to everyone. Everyone who did not look for it, everyone who believed in it, everyone who understood but kept silent, everyone who justified the criminal decisions of this dictator, everyone who turned a blind eye on the deeds of the Russian soldiers, everyone who helped Putin's regime to organize inhuman terror in a neighboring state. Ksenia Barvinenko, Special Report.